I have young daughters, so I can start off by asking if anyone knows why, why, um, why people like bananas. It's because they have a peel. Yeah, I could do this all day long. I, uh, no, I won't. But I won't. It's 2.15. So that segment weighs into, I guess, uh, me introducing myself. We should probably do that. So we don't have any slides for that. My name is Matthew Tift, and I work at Lullabot. And I am one of the co-maintainers of the Drupal 8 configuration system. And... This. And, and I'm Alex Pot. I'm one of the Drupal 8 core maintainers. I'm also a maintainer for configuration management, and most of it is my fault. So <laughs> feel free to apportion credit and blame as you feel free. I'm really lucky that Chapter 3 pays for me basically to spend 99% of my time working on core because they believe in Drupal 8. Cool. So. We're here to talk about the configuration system. And we can start off by saying that you may have heard this referred to as CMI, the Configuration Management Initiative. And that was a thing, but now that initiative is over. And now we have the configuration system. So if you want to be you know, all technical about it, we're not here to talk about CMI. We're here to talk about the configuration system. And in Drupal 8, and we're going to just talk today briefly about what it is, some of the benefits, how it works, and some, some uh, continuous integration. So what, what we're here today is to, to get into a little bit of the technical details. We build this as an advanced session for developers. So we will get into some of the uh, meteor aspects of the configuration system, but we are going to start off with talking about some of the main sort of principles because a lot of the people I've been talking with that have been trying to do things with the configuration system, sometimes it helps just to con sort of conceptualize what it is for, what, why we built it, what was the problem we're trying to solve. So in general, configuration management is a way to try and manage consistency, to have control over your code base, to be able to move your metadata around and have a way to deploy to your production server. So these are some of the key aspects of configuration management, generally speaking. But really, the use case that we tried to solve in Drupal 8 was this one. So if you remember nothing else from today, think about the configuration management as a system that moves configuration from your development server to your production server. We're not trying to be able to say, hey, I'm working on whitehouse.gov and I'm going to go and export my configuration and then I'm going to go over to NBC.com and import it and have it look just like whitehouse.gov. It doesn't work that way. The idea is that we're moving between the same instances of the same site, or different instances of the same site. Now, the way we built the system, we allow you to do that. But actually, that's just some random drawing of configuration management. And the point here is that you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. We tried to make this really flexible, but the main use case that we're solving in core is development to production. Yeah, and so the main way that we made it flexible is by having absolutely no opinion about how you manage your configuration once you've exported it from Drupal. It's up to you to de design your own processes. Um, but that said, we all want to be able to build sites and deploy that configuration in a reliable way. So at the end of this presentation, I'm going to recommend a way in Drupal 8 of just simply building a site and managing its configuration. And I'll show you how to do that. So if, if you wanted to have like a one sentence definition of what configuration management is, this is how, this is one way I think of reducing it to one sentence. So we do have our own sort of unique approach for Drupal 8 and how we're handling configuration management. So I'm going to say a little bit about how that works. And this is going to go from sort of simple to slightly more complex. But at, at, at the very basic configuration in Drupal, Eight is types of things. So 
these are some of the types of things that configuration management is. A, a view is configuration. A user role is configuration. And these are different from the things. So the things in Drupal 8 would be the article, something like a user. These are the things that you create. So the configuration is, in a way, is like the, uh, the mold, and then the content is the, 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 what you get from that mold. And another way that you can think about it that sort of maps these two ideas of things and type of things is site builder versus site editor. So the person who is building the site is creating configuration, and then the site editor is creating the content. So that is one of the things that can become uh, tricky right now in Drupal 7 is that configuration and content coexist in the database, and they exist in lots of different places. Uh, but we try and make a clear distinction between these two. So getting slightly more complicated, though, is that there are really two kinds of configuration in Drupal 8. One is simple configuration, and one is the other is configuration entities. So a configuration entity, when you're building a site and you're trying to figure out how I should develop a particular thing, if you need exactly one copy or one version, that is simple configuration. So an example of this would be something like your site name. You probably don't need 13 or 14 site names. You just need one. And that is stored in, in, uh, as a simple key value pair. So that's what uh, a simple configuration is. The configuration entity, again, sort of a general concept to keep in mind, is that this is zero or more. So if you're creating a view, you might have lots of views. Or you might create a view, but it doesn't have anything. You might, it's like having a SQL query that returns null results. So that's what I mean when I say a configuration entity is zero or more items. So there are other types of data in Drupal 8, and these aren't part of the purview of the configuration system. So for example, the last time you ran cron, that's not really configuration. It's also not really content. So that is something that we store in the state system. And another example would be like session management information, where that too is not really configuration. It's not really content. But for the sake of um, understanding the configuration system, it's often helpful to think about that in terms of your site builder, site editor, content, and lots of sort of ways to divide that into two. Now, the benefits of having a configuration system are many, but let me just touch on a few of them. The first is that between Dru from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, we have 50 fewer database tables. And that's because in Drupal 7, storing configuration, you could do it in lots of different ways. So lots of modules impl implemented their own ways to manage configuration because there wasn't a single API for developers. In Drupal 8, now that's what the configuration provides, is a single way to access. So whether you're trying to uh, access something in the field system or something through views or something in your module, use the same API to store c configuration, save configuration, delete configuration, and that's what the configuration system provides. It reduces the need for modules like features and strong arm. It doesn't eliminate them, and that's kind of a different use case, but that is one of the benefits that a lot of people think about with the configuration system. Yeah, it's a, I mean, Mike put us at the back and he will add more in, in a buff that will follow this um, session. But, but features now in, in Drupal 8 is, is about uh, packaging configuration to, to share between different sites. It's not about um, a deployment mechanism for a single site instance. So it's really focusing on its original use case. And, and the, the use case that a lot of us used it for in Drupal 7 to, to manage deployment between dev and prod, um, it's, it's not trying to solve anymore. That's solved by the configuration system. Another key benefit of the configuration system, and something that we dealt with a lot while building it, was making it translatable. So I have a little quick example here of translating um, something in Drupal 8. So for example, wh what I mean by that is, like, say you have this form with your site details and you have your site name and your slogan and your email address. 
The configuration system allows us to, to track what kind of data goes in each of those fields. So we know that when you go to translate them, what the email address is not something you need translated. So this is the type of problem that the configuration system is, is solving and it's allowing to have a site that can be translated fairly easy and, and we know that an email address, for example, is not translated. Another key benefit of the configuration system is that it's highly swappable, that if you want to use MongoDB or if you want to use SQL Server or if you want to use files, we tried to make it very flexible. And I know that that causes, <laughs> that's a question I get a lot is people say, well, what's the best way to do this? Well, there are lots of different use cases depending on the kind of sites you're building and it is highly swappable, but uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, sort of a feature that a lot of people uh, can take advantage of, but maybe not lots of sites will need to. And I will say, even some sites, some uh, smaller sites or basic sites, so, you know, like if you're just building um, a site where you don't really even um, need to have a development server, you don't even need to use the configuration system. It's really set up so it can even just, you know, work on its own in the, in the background without needing to swap it or even know it's there. But that's not why you people are here. So a big sort of um, mental change, in my opinion, between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 is that the configuration system now assumes that the site owns its configuration. And to me, this seems different from how I thought about Drupal 7, where I thought about it as a module owning its configuration. So when the module maintainer changed something with the module, I sort of kind of expected that sometimes that might change with my site. One of the assumptions we made building the Drupal 8 configuration system is that the site owns the data or the configuration. So that's something else to keep in mind as you're building sites, as you're thinking about the different more complicated use cases. And the, and the reason we did that is because we are focusing on, on the idea that you're going to want to deploy from development to production so that you're, you've got to move your configuration there. The modules don't play any part in that move, so at what point you, are you validating? So if you go in and uh, a module makes a change to a view that you've already QA'd and you like that old name and they change the name of that view on you, like, well, you've QA'd that. That's not the purview of the module. Yes, if the module like changes a plugin and needs to change the configuration, then it's gonna go and update the, the view to make it work, but, but cosmetic things should be owned by the site and you should have you should have full control and the module should just get out of your way so we're going to talk a little bit briefly about how it works before we jump into a demo but in general the sort of life cycle of configuration in Drupal 8 is that frequently it will start with a module providing configuration in a file and when that module is installed, the configuration goes from, is read from the file and goes into the database. And then when you need to deploy that configuration from one instance of the site to another, you export it as a file and then you import it on your production server. So in my mind, I have this mental image of going from files to database to files. And the other way you can, of course, get configuration in your site is if you allow your site editors to change configuration in the UI. That, of course, is another way to put configuration into the database, which then can be exported as files. So, what's an example of that? Well, let's talk about JPEG quality, something that I'm sure many of you are concerned very much with on your Drupal sites. It's usually the first thing I check is to see what we have that set. Well, the default number for that is 75%. So that is provided in the system uh, module in system.image.gd.yaml, and that's what this file looks like. And when you install Drupal, it imports that, and here you have that same number on your, in your UI, the JPEG quality. So what happens when that module is installed then is that number and that, that uh, key get imported into the database. And here I've selected um, everything from the, conf the config table where the name is system.image.gd and that's where it exists. So 
This is the going from files to the database. And then when I export my configuration, one of the files that I'm exporting is system.image.gd.yaml, and that has the JPEG quality again. So this is like the most basic example, and I haven't changed it now. If we did change it in the UI to 85 or something like that, then of course that would be reflected in your files. But this is, this is the mindset that I think helps some people understand the configuration is going from the, the files that the module installs to the database to files. So, so, I have this conversation all the time. Yes, files. Now, a couple of years we were going around saying configuration is stored in files. And for a while, that's how it was working, where it wasn't in the database by default. Now, I did say it's swappable, so there are all kinds of ways to do this, but we chose to switch back to using the database for a number of reasons. One was we felt it was more, cons more secure, that we were using a sort of security by obscurity principle, so when you would import your configuration, it would go from that module file into uh, your active directory, and then the Drupal site would read from that, but then um, people were worried that you could somehow hack that, that you could find that file and you could go in and you could, you know, hack a site that way. But, so we think it's more secure to have that configuration in the database. It's also faster in many cases. Again, I'm sort of generalizing, but in many cases, it's faster to read and write to the database than it is to files. This also eliminates the temptation to hack your active config, which if, if you're storing configuration in files, which you can do, uh, it's tempting just to go in there and change that, but you shouldn't do that. And by storing it in the database, it, it makes it so you can't just go into the files and change that. Yeah, I mean, obviously for something like the JPEG quality, if you went in and changed it in the file that was being read immediately into your site to 85, it's not gonna matter. But say you went and uh, like actually which modules are installed on your site is stored in a file called core, uh, it's stored in the configuration <coughs> object called core.extension. If you just went in there and added a module, then that suddenly that module's code would be, would be loaded during, during the request and the, m the module has not actually been installed properly because there'd be no ability to react to it. Whereas if, if, if you don't store, uh, you don't make it easy to change those, the, those configuration objects, but you, you make it so that people have to like, export the files, then make changes to them by hand, and then run the import again, then we can do validation and check that the module's there. We can then go and install the module for you um, and, and, and react to configuration change. So that's what, one of the main reasons we moved it out of uh, the active configuration out of files. Another benefit is that for some sites, again, like the ones that might not even need the configuration, it can be convenient if the database basically contains everything. That's our main model now with Drupal 7. You take your code, you take your database, in some cases you also take a big files directory, and from there you can work on your own site and do your development that way. And by storing configuration separately, uh, that did create a sort of extra thing that you needed to become useful as a developer right away. Uh, so by having that still in the database, it does allow in certain uh, instances to make it so you can be uh, more productive quickly or, or you can, again, do those, those simpler use cases where you, don't, you might not have a complex uh, continuous integration or something like that. So if we compare how we're doing things in Drupal 8 then, where I talked about files to database to files, in Drupal 7, sometimes configuration was provided by files and sometimes it went into the database, but then getting the configuration out of your site was not always a consistent process. So I have a question mark there to represent that. So what do I mean by that? So for example, in this, uh, this form array here, we have the variable git, and that is grabbing JPEG quality. So in this particular uh, instance, we have that, it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of mixed in there with the other information about the, the form. So this is one way to store the information in something, again, like as simple as JPEG quality. We can, we can find ways around, but as many of us who know that it, it's a tricky thing in Drupal 7 to consistently pull your configuration information out. So this is, again, the problem we're 
we're trying to solve. So, so and another really big advantage that Drupal 8 has there is that you only define your default in one place. So in, in Drupal 7, every time you did your variable get for, you, for your image JPEG quality, you would have to like say, if it's not set, use 75. And so if you, if you made a change, and maybe you changed the default in one place, like in the form to 85, but you forgot to change it where it actually was, was being used, then it would still be 75. So you, as a module maintainer, you, ha you have to always go, okay, I'm gonna change this, the default, and then I'm gonna have to change it everywhere and not, not miss it. And then if another module was depending on you, they would have to know you'd change the default as well. Um, but now you know because it's only ever set in one place that, it's, that the default is gonna be the same for everyone. Yeah, it is actually, it's a, it's a stupidly small thing, but it is so much easier. Well, at least one guy's excited. <laughs> Thanks, man. He's been bitten by the pain. Once you've been bitten by the pain once, you never forget. So it, it doesn't take, you don't have to be an advanced developer to tell that this is more complicated than this. So that's the difference, sort of in a nutshell, how I like to explain the difference. So. In Drupal 7, we have the variable table. Well, that is gone in Drupal 8. It, we still have a similar sort of thing. That, you know, we still have our key value pair stored in here with our JPEG quality that we're very concerned about. Um, but the, the, the difference is when we want to take that number, uh, whether you change it in the unif user interface or you want to change um, all your other configuration from your site, it's difficult, it's difficult to consistently export that to identify problems. And this is, um, I mean, no offense, Mike, but this is the thing so many of us struggle with is making features do this awesome work in, in a way that maybe it wasn't designed to do. Um, but it, it's the thing we've been using. So, develop, so this is a developer session. We know that this is, using features is the way to handle your configuration in Drupal 8 but it does make some of these issues uh, more difficult to handle. Now, how do I use this fancy new configuration system you're wondering? Here's another key thing. If this, if there are two things you remember from this session. This is the second one, is that you can only synchronize configuration between cloned instances of a site. Now, I mentioned that before and I'll mention it again, but this has to do going back with dev to prod because when you try to export configuration from one site and import it into another site that has a different UUID, then it won't work. It just won't work because that's not the use case we're trying to solve. So how do you use it? Well, you make sure first that you have cloned instances of the same site. And then you use this new module, this configuration manager module, which we'll see. And it's a new little section on configuration management and we have the ability now to import and export, do full imports and exports. And I will say that uh, in general, we recommend that you'll be much safer doing full imports and ex exports because that is how the configuration system can best do its work to check for dependencies when you're moving from one instance of the site to another is by doing a full import and a full export. I thought you were going to say something. You're just drinking. Yeah. You want to say something. I think so. Um, so, so one of the, an, another big change in, in Drupal 8 is that we, we conf configuration entities, things like node, uh, node types, are often depended on by lots of things. So, uh, so a, a, the, the simple example would be a field. If you add a field to a, to a, to a node, then obviously if you remove that node type, you expect it to to clean up the, the, the fields. And it does in, in, in Drupal 7, it, it has special code and it goes, goes and deletes the fields. But actually, when you build out a Drupal, a Drupal site, you're, you're building up a web of dependencies amongst all your configuration. You might add a view that filters on that node type. And then if you delete that node type in Drupal 7, that view is just broken. In Drupal 8, because we have an understanding of the dependencies between everything, like when you add that the, the, the filter to the view on the node type, it goes, okay, that means that this view is dependent on that node type, and we store that information in the configuration entity, so when you delete the node type, it goes, actually, we're also gonna have to do something about this view, and that's really powerful. It's much harder to break your site just by clicking around the UI and deleting things which, which are related, but you've forgotten about because you did that six months ago. 
One of the nice things is when you are exporting and importing your configuration, we do in the UI give you a way to view differences. And here's a, a simple example of changing the name from site install to new site, which is probably something you do a lot. Not really, okay. But this is the example we always show up here. But when you go to develop your first module then, well, there is a new paradigm with the configuration system. And there are at least three directories that you want to be aware of and understand how they work. So the first one that you should know about is config slash install. So we, we at one point changed the name of this to config.install to make it very obvious that when you install a module that has, a conf has configuration in its directory that's config slash install, that this happens at install time. So that means don't try and go in and change the configuration in your module that's already been installed that has configuration in the install directory because it's only read at install time. The other directory is config slash optional. Now this one is a little bit more complex. It solves a number of problems. But for example, if you are creating a module and then you install it, you're working along locally, but then you uninstall it, the configuration stays with the site because as we said, the site owns the configuration. So we've had some, we had some, you know, lots of discussions about how we could handle this, but basically we said, well, we should assume that if someone uninstalls a module that we should leave the configuration there in some cases. And that's why we created the config.optional directory. So you can reinstall a module and it will simply say, oh, that's, that file already exists, I'm not gonna reinstall it. And then the other problem um, it fixes is, you wanted to say it, didn't you? I'll let you say it. All right. Um, okay, so, so the, the node module has integration with views, but the node module doesn't want to depend on views. You don't want to have to have views to use node. So any, any like optional uh, integration, like a, like a front page view where, which, lists, which, which lists nodes, it isn't required by that module. You can put in config slash optional, which means that when you install node, it goes, okay, is views installed? Not, it's going to ignore it. But the flip side of that is when views is installed, it looks through all the installed modules optional directories and goes, hey, does any of these have any views for me? And can those, all those views dependencies be satisfied? And it will create them. So it's, so it's, it's a really nice way of like, providing optional integration um, with your module without actually having a dependency on that. So say you want to provide a very simple UI in your module, but you want to, be, uh, you want to also provide a, a, a richer UI built with views but you don't want to have a dependency, just stick it in there, and then if the site installs views, then they'll get the nice rich UI, or if they don't, it'll fall back to your simple UI. So you'll have to decide then, again, in your particular use case with your particular module, you'll have to say, is this configuration absolutely necessary for the module to function? And so you should put it in your install directory, and then you should also perhaps clean it up after you uninstall, otherwise you'll have problems reinstalling. Or you should say, oh, I want to put this configuration in my optional directory because it's not necessary for the module to function, and when I reinstall it, I just want that configuration to stay there. Now, we also have to, you know, get into this issue of, you know, if, if you were the kind of person that was, you know, frequently doing something like uh, disabling a module in, in Drupal 7, just temporarily, you wouldn't... We don't have disabling in Drupal 8 now. It's only installing and uninstalling. So this provides another mechanism of, of solving some of those issues where before we might have disabled the module. Now we can say, oh, right, well, I'm going to uninstall it, but I want the configuration to stay there. Put it in the optional directory. And then finally, the third directory that you want to be aware of is the schema directory, or the config slash schema directory. And this one is also very important because it describes your configuration. So earlier when I showed that the, in the translation system, we want to identify something like email as not being translatable, we do that in a schema file. So you have schema files in your module that 
describe the configuration and they will say things like, Does, is this translatable? Yes or no. Is this a string? Yes or no. Do you, do you want this to be stored as an integer and not force everything to be stored as a string? So that, those are three directories that you'll want to make sure you're very aware of when you're doing module development. So just a little bit more on schema. And, and we can actually talk about the, the image quality example that we have. Like one of the things that people used to do in Drupal 7 is, is set variables from the command line, so like a bit of a Drush variable set. And you might set that to like whatever, 85. But when you do that from the command line in, in, in Drupal 7, it can't know what the, what the module expected that variable type to be. So every single variable set will be a string. Um, what Drupal 8 does is it's able to enforce the type. So it knows that if you go and change that um, in through the similar command in, in, in Drupal 8 Drush config set, it will actually save it as the expected integer. So this this is a, this gives us a strictness and robustness that means it's it's much more um, difficult to get weird errors of when you set something to like zero or a, an empty string. Like it will it will behave in a predictable way because the, the, the actual variable type is strict. So the module can depend on the fact that it knows that its configuration is going to be an integer, a float, or a string, which is which kind of solves like those really hard to repeat bugs when someone comes into your module issue queue and goes, I've done something weird and it's broken like this and you're like, how did you ever do that? And yet what and the reason is like PHP's like kind of duck typing is like, whoa, weird. But now that doesn't happen. And that's awesome. So we have now reached the demo portion of their show. And up next is Alex Pot. So before I start, I was just wondering how many people in the room have actually used the Drupal 8 configuration export import in anger? Whoa, that's cool. Righty. So I'm going to show you um, something that I've, I've been working on um, since before Drupal 8 was, was, was launched, and I'm now working at getting into, into core and hopefully will be available in 8.2, but it's a kind of recommended way of, of working to solve the simple case of, like, I want to build a site for a client, and I'm one of N developers who are working on it, and we want to manage our configuration and deploy it to that site when it's in production. So build in a local environment and deploy on some production server. I just would like to uh, emphasize that what he's showing you now, I don't think any of you have ever seen before. It seemed pretty <laughs> clever to me, so this is new. This is like news. Well, Are there reporters it's in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> so, so here I just have a site which I've installed standard and I've, I've, I've done, um, I've in uninstalled a few things like Node and I've changed uh, it to use my own install profile. Um, I basically just said, okay, I'm gonna create an install profile of my profile, and I've dumped all the configuration into that install profile. So, quite simply here, I have like, I'm gonna have to move this up. You're not gonna see that, and make it bigger. Whoa, wrong thing. That's hard. Right. So, so this is this is like my own install profile. All it contains is like an info.yaml file, which is saying it's an install profile, a very tiny install file, and it contains a lot of configuration. But it's not in one of those three directories that we were talking about. It's in a different directory, which I've just called sync, and that's like containing the whole site. And the, the way that this works is basically I'm going to work on my site, I'm going to install some stuff, and then I'm going to export my configuration. So here I am, I'm going to go, okay, what I really want is a better site name. <coughs> um, and I want to extend it. Let's have, oh, where is node? Node's installed. Uh, what do I want to enable? I don't have views. Let's, yeah, let's go for views. Let's have a view. Thank you for that was. Um, and I'll quickly come in here and view. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'll create a view. I'll create a no type. That's what we'll do. Um, 
because they are really simple. I don't have any. Let's just create a blog. Save and manage fields. So I can now come here and use Drush. Drush has got some nice uh, config integration. And as a command, we add Drush config export, Drush sex. Um, <coughs> and and what that's telling me is it's going to create these 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 views. It's going to create the view settings file. It's going to create some uh, display uh, modes for my my new content type. It's going to create a body field for it, and it's going to actually the core extension stuff that's going on here. It's going to install views, and it's going to change my site name. And that's just going to um, put that in my profile config sync directory, um, which is great. So I've done that, and now it's files, and it's a module. So I just manage it like a module, because it is. Um, so I can just add it to Git. I can have a look and go, oh, yeah, nice. It's changing all that. There's my site name. Great. <coughs> so I'll commit that. Whatever, version 2, whatever we want to do. And then I can come to my other site, which was a previous version. Um, and I can see a kind of structure, and I go, OK. It's called site install. It's called site install. Does it have any content types? It certainly doesn't. It doesn't have views, but you can't see that because I didn't enable views UI. And then I can just pull. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and no, I don't need to. It's not working like that. <laughs> um, it's just whatever. We won't worry about that. Um, <coughs> so yeah, and so I can pull in my changes. I can review them before I do anything. It all looks good. Um, and then I can come to my site, and I can just come into configuration and go to conf config sync. And as Matt showed you before, like here's, here is everything that's going on. I can see. What it's, what it's creating, I can see what it's changing. Come in here and do a diff and go, oh yeah, Fuse is going to be enabled. Nice. And then I can just click Import All. So what's cool about that is that it gives us a way to manage the whole uh, the site configuration as an install profile. So we all know how to manage module versions. You know how to push modules to production. It's just, just the same way. But what's really great is this. Um, new developer comes and they just get the code and they don't have the database set up. That's not away from there. Why is it always harder? And come to the site. <coughs> now, at the moment, this doesn't work as well as it could. But once certain stuff moves into core, this will be seamless. But I can come here and I can just choose that, that profile, because it is just an install profile. I can go, OK, install. So, and what this does at the moment is it just, all it does is install the required modules and the configuration manager. This doesn't matter because it's going to change. Obviously, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be filling in, only, we'd only be creating the user because all of this stuff is already decided by the profile. That looks terrible, but quite simply, I just come to configuration. There is everything to synchronize. I import everything, and as a developer, I'm ready to go. I can now make changes on this site, export them back to my install profile, commit, someone does a pull. <laughs> and then, so, so what's happening now? <laughs> um, what's happening now is it's installing all the modules, um, and then it goes through and it creates um, all, the, all the config entities, and then it is finished, and now we're here. We have the same stuff, structure, back to exactly where we were. There's my blog content type, site name. And it just works. Um, so yeah, um, and the code that is necessary just to make that work, just to show you like kind of how, 
how simple this is. So I just wanted to add that when I first saw this, what I realized is that this, syst this workflow kind of allows that directory to do double duty. One, it's the install profile, but two, it's also your, your uh, staging directory. So it allows, it allows you to you know, have fewer steps in the process when you're starting up on a new site. It allows you to not have to worry about making sure you're getting all your UUIDs and whatnot correct when you do same instances of the same site, which is something that trips people up. And it, to me, it reminds me a little bit of like I'm working on a site and you often have like site underscore custom to put all your custom code in. And that's kind of the function that this is serving as this one place where you're going to put most of your, your, your custom configuration for the site. So I, I, I think, based on having thought about this for a few hours, that this could be a good recommended uh, workflow that's slightly different from what one of the, a couple of the other workflows that we've mentioned in the past. And, and, and so, yeah, all the, all, this, all the install profile does is just change the UUID that it generates during install to be the one that's in your, in your config sync directory, and it just sets the, 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 the directory where it's going to get the configuration from to the profiles directory, and that is it, and it just works. And, and so, look, actually, those two steps will go away in, 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 in the future, and all, all that should happen is... Uh, what I want to see is just people having to write config install true in their profile. And then there'll be a tool, so you go and create your, you create your site the first time, and you're going to drush, drush, make me a profile, and I'll just create this for you, just this, and dump your config to that directory, and share it with the other developers, and everyone can just work on the same site. And production uses the same install profile, make changes, sync, away you go. Those things don't currently exist, by the way. That's not a thing right now. No, not yet. So what he has is a workaround right now. Yeah. This. Yeah. Because otherwise, he complains about the UUID. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so right now, what you can do, the, 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 the easiest way of working around it is to use um, something called the, the, the config installer module, which is, a, it is another install profile that allows you to take a, a, a tarball or a directory and do that. But there's already an issue like to try and bring that work into core. And this is just like a little addition to that work that will, that will actually make it completely simple. And it just works. <laughs> so I think we're ready for questions. Yeah. <laughs> There's a mic up here. If you, get, if you have questions, come on up so we can have those for transparency. Should I go now? Yeah, go for it. Um, so in terms of managing uh, like modules that are enabled, I've been running the issues with having like views UI turned on on dev and then turned off in prod. Do you have recommendation workflows for that? Um, so there, there, is, there is something in Drush that can, that can help. Like, remove modules during the export, but we don't have a solution for that at this okay. moment. Right. Not, not a recommended one, other than just having some process that, that, that when you do your, your config export, like actually just manipulating the configuration on that. What would be nice is if like some, some hook fired that, that you, or event fired that you could then go and just manipulate and say, actually, I don't want that module. Yeah. But, but it's, it's not hard, it's just, it just hasn't been written yet. Yeah, so right now it's a little more time consuming to make sure you, you yeah. handle that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the MongoDB, that that would be an option, an alternate option. Is that built in, or is that just available if you write it all? It's, it's available if, if you write it. Like the, the MongoDB driver got, got quite far for Drupal 8, but then I think funding dried up. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the config table was already handled, because it's just a key value store. Um, there, there are no. It, it, it behaves exactly like a key value store. So you, it's not difficult for Mongo. It's not difficult to put it in, in, in any key value store that you like. Okay. It, it's simple. It's one of the easier things. Louder? Oh, sorry. Uh, so I know one of the things in progress is like content deployment tools. Yep. On the other side, I've run into things where it's 
parts of the site that the end user might want to change, like contact forms, where they might want to create a new contact form on the production site. Is there anything that would help to make sure that when we're developing and we're deploying our development changes to the production site, that we can avoid overwriting some of those things that we might want to make available to so yeah, users? So the question was, um, like, our, our site um, administrators are creating contact forms on the live site. How do we manage like, live change? Um, so this, the simple answer to that is actually when you when you do uh, an import, if there's been uh, differences since the last import, so if there's been changes to the active configuration, there's a warning there. So it tells you you might overwrite changes. So if you see that warning, then you then the thing to do is is to export the configuration from live and merge it into your install profile and in, in this or into wherever you're storing your your shared config, and then review those changes and go we want those or we don't want those. We're happy to get rid of that. But, but that's, you have to manage, if you allow people to make changes on live, you have to manage the process of bringing those changes back into your development workflow. But, but. I'll just add too that some people now in Drupal 8 are configuring their sites so that nobody is making changes in the UI to configuration. That it's only done by developers in code and pushed up. So that is another, workflow that could, that, that will probably work for a lot of sites where you actually don't ever want people to change configuration on the site in the UI, only have it done in code so you can manage it, you can do your QA that way. And there are, there's a config read only module that, that does that, so. Yeah, my question's related to that. Um, I mean, we have use cases, that performance config is a good use case, but we come across it with module config where we need to change it per environment and we, we're having constant issues where, oh shoot, we want caching enabled, we need to deploy it, so we update the config, and now caching is enabled on dev, but we don't want it enabled on dev, and so we're, we're having problems with that. So, so, so the traditional way of trying to manage that is to make your active configuration what you expect in live, and then do overrides in your, in your settings PHP for, for, for your development, because you don't generally move your, your settings PHP. Um, that, that that's the way of doing it. Thank you. Um, and so, and one of the, uh, another another big advantage of Drupal 8 is that um, we've made sure that when you actually edit configuration in the UI, those overrides from your settings PHP don't uh, don't get into the form, so that so that you don't bleed your development overrides up into your production by mistakenly saving a, some form that has one of those overrides in. It, it's a bit of a he it's good, but it's a bit of a headache. I mean, it's because it, because you're sometimes you see you're like you're looking and saying, oh, this is saying like caching is on, but it's actually off. But it's it's hard to have what we had before was difficult. What we have now is difficult in a different way, but it's in a way that's probably better for people. We've tried to discuss about how we could actually tell people that there's an override that that is in settings PHP, but we haven't yet come to an agreement because, because of the, the dynamic nature of how overrides can apply. Uh, hey, thank you for the session. I have a question. In case if we have a distribution that needs to be installed on the multiple instances, what is the best way to approach UUAD issue? <laughs> um, so the question was, um, I've got a distribution. How am I going to manage UUIDs? Um, I think best practices there are being worked out. It really depends on, on the nature of your distribution. Um, if your distribution and you, you've, you've created like a, a blog and it is actually the same blog on all these different sites, then you want them to have the same UUID. But if you're creating something like Commerce Kickstart and, and every, every site is actually a really different thing, it's a proper distribution, then you don't want them to have the same UUIDs. And yeah, it's tricky. It's, it's up to the distribution to decide. So, like, if it's an internal distribution that's built to, like, power, um, like, uh, I don't know, different faculties at a university, you might choose to have the same UUIDs because then it makes it really simple to know that that's actually the, the one that you've deployed with your distribution. But if you're creating something for, like, general global usage, then, like, everyone having exactly the same blog, even after they've gone and customized it, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's first. Our is the first case. So is it something done in install profile where you said, uh, the UUID for all sites? Uh, I mean, is it something said during installation, like the same UUID for 
all sites or it's done. So, it's so in, in your in your yeah. instance, if if you want like it actually to be the same configuration everywhere, but you want a different site UID on each different install, yeah. then what you could do is you could you could generate that UUID on install for just the system site. Oh, got it. So do the opposite of what I was doing. All right. Okay. So that would stop them syncing to each other, but it would allow you to push configuration change to your distribution. All right. Thank you. That, that reminded me too that we should at 3:45 there's going to be a boff where we're going to talk. Mike P Potter's here, and we're going to talk about ways where you can use the configuration system with features, and what the features module has to offer in uh, cases where you actually do want to package up individual configuration, which is not quite what you're talking about, but that's something that the features module is hap 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 or handling. Um, but I think Alex and I are both. I'm going to be there. We're going to both be there to, and tell us what you think about the session too. I should say that. So, so which which room is that buff in? Right. I've got it here. Okay, it is in two eight nine. Next. Uh, two questions. One, this place is packed, and uh, a long line of questions. Um, is hopefully this will help address. Um, is this like? I've, I've looked for documentation on the configuration. I've never seen optional or schema or sync anywhere documented. Is this documented anywhere? Um, uh, I think so. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hoping that'll be helpful. You know. Let's see. Uh, we have a we have a site that we were using. Triple O. I hope it's not documented there. It's got to be documented on Triple O. No, I know, but I have links. Ah. Uh. That might be down now. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's down. What's down? Uh, Drupal 8 CMI. Just have to go. Yeah. Yeah, we can try and we can try and look that for for the great for, for stuff. Uh, second question is, it, I, it seemed to he mentioned uh, preventing people from hacking uh, active configuration. Um, I'm a, a Drupal 8 module developer. I don't have any experience in 7, so. Um, but um, I've been having, found it pretty much impossible to edit the configuration uh, the, if there's an active configuration. The only way, um, not, not just through YAML files, but through the import or any sort of single thing. It says act, this configuration is already an active config. Sure. So, so th there's a module for you. Okay. <laughs> um, the config develop module allows you to basically always sync between your module and the active configuration whilst you're in development. Okay. Thank you. Um, a lot of my questions were actually already answered. Thanks, guys. Um, but we're really trying to work out kind of a uh, a multi-site sort of thing. So. You know, some of the UID collisions have been complicated, and then the updating stuff. Um, one, one thing that we're kind of leaning towards is, you know, we have some th some certain uh, things that might be shared amongst multiple uh, multiple modules might rely on, say, one uh, entity bundle. So we're kind of going the route of creating really specific, uh, like this module will only install this one thing and it's starting to feel like a little like it might be overkill like we're making you know these all these things depend on one thing is that is there any sort of alternative uh not, not really. I mean, that, the way in which you make your packages mm -hmm. and so that they can be like shipped around the different bits of functionality you want, that's what Features is trying to help you do and work out. The, it, it, features at the moment tries to use the dependency graph to make some sensible suggestions around those packages because basically in Drupal 8, Features is a module builder. And, and in building modules, what it's trying to do is like group bits of related configuration and put them together and then let those modules depend on each other in a way that makes sense. Um, so. So it depends on, like, you, you, you have to do some design there and, and sit down and go, okay, well, what really makes sense? Like, what functionality is common for everything? Shall, shall we build, like, a common module for the, these specific things to, to fall off? And then, and then if you find that you've got getting, like, one module per, per YAML file, that's, you'd probably, there's probably something that's, like, a little bit weird about how you're trying to deploy those features. Right, and you said we, it is pretty complicated, so we're <laughs> trying to work all that out right now. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, on one project we were working on, we found that occasionally we'd have issues um, with um, conflicts where multiple developers were working on the same project where um, configurations would get overwritten if you affected the same like configuration file. Or like say a developer did a full configuration export and accidentally committed things to like the sync folder that weren't necessary. You have like any workflow recommendations for like minimalizing those conflicts when you've got multiple developers yep. configuring. Yep, I do. Yeah. Um, two two recommendations. One, use Git because it will detect conflicts when things have been changed by two different people. Mm -hmm. So treating your configuration like code and extending from using Git as a, as the way to store and manage like uh, conflict is a proper code review. Treat your configuration like code. And, and have people review it. So that, you know, the, the, the reason we chose YAML is that it's very easy for humans to read and work out what that's doing. So you should be able to look at a change set and go, that has the expected changes or that doesn't. Because um, that, you know, that's the whole point. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's about taking, taking the, the care of the quality that you would over code and treating it the same way. Hi, uh, we're currently building a, a Drupal 8 install pro profile for uh, university installation. So basically, it's sort of a distribution. All sites will, will, will start from the same uh, footprint, uh, and they'll evolve you know, in, into the future. Uh, the question I have is many sites won't need to use uh, config management uh, or the configuration system as far as um, workflow goes. You know, they'll, they'll be in dev, they'll go, to, they'll go live, and then their site will continue to evolve there. But we will have some custom ones that will want to use a Git workflow to deploy um, configuration. I'm just wondering if there's any recommendations on how to do that. Is it a custom module that's particular for that, uh, for, for each site that loads its own configuration? Or what, what would be our best uh, way to tackle that? Um, it depends on, on whether you want to share that that feature between different different sites. If you do, then maybe like f the features module and using that to package up the configuration is one option for you. Or another option is just in those instances, like ha ha let let those sites have their own install profile and manage it the way that I demoed uh, demoed here today, and just like have a specific install profile for that for those sites which are custom, and have a generic one for the, for for the for the common use case. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Is it possible to to have them just have a, a I mean, I guess it's the same thing, just a custom module that also contains other site overrides and configurations and code that also loads their own, you know, overridden configuration or override configuration? It, it's, it's possible, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yes, I was wondering if the uh, CM management, uh, I guess that's redundant, uh, uses Drush Make. Is Drush Make still a thing in Drupal 8? <laughs> um, so Dr Drushmaker is solving a different problem. It's like a, it's it's composing your code, um, and the kind of the hint in the answer I'm about to give is is in the word that I just chose. Um, basically, in Drupal 8, Drushmaker it will be replaced by Composer. So you will, you will create a, a Composer.json file that like says that I want Drupal and I want these modules, and then you can run like Composer install, and that will go and get all the code for you, and then you will. Um, Run, run Drupal install. I, I know people have mentioned using different modules and in different instances. So Composer can say grab certain things and modules in certain instances and other things and not, and then the configuration yeah. can be on top of that. Okay. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's just the standard like code management. Right. So yeah, you could do it that way if you wanted to have a different Composer file for all your different projects. But that's getting into the but then then everything is just a custom build, right? Right. So yeah, because yeah, I, I heard you mention build, but this is sort of configuration, not actually configuration for builds? No. Yeah, well, that's out of scope a bit? Or? Yeah, that's out of scope. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, answer a previous question about finding documentation for this. I'll just, I'll put, I'll put a little plug in here for a website called uh, drupal.org or a web, a web page slash list hyphen changes. And this is not documentation per se, but it's where we have doc tried to always document things that have changed from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So I just looked up config slash install on, or in config, config slash optional, and I found information here where, like, here is where a change record for when we added config slash optional, which links to the issue where we added it. 
that's not the best place to look, but right now that is one of the best places to get documentation. So if that's one place to look, but we do have information on the, the configuration API page, so api.drupal.org configuration, and it talks about the, uh, like the optional module in the folder structure and that kind of thing here, so. Yeah, and if you, if you find missing documentation, all docs pages on drupal.org are editable. If you're logged in, please feel free to contribute. Well, so, um, back. Uh, another kind of thing that I've been, been kind of work, trying to work out is when the line between content and config is a little blurred. You know, we saw like the modules for uh, being able to import content, but there are benefits to, uh, an example is taxonomy where traditionally a lot of times terms would be a lot closer to configuration than content. And, you know, we're looking at it and it's like, well, this would actually benefit a lot from being considered uh, configuration rather than being used in this content way so that we can, you know, have machine names and all this sort of nice stuff, uh, the whole configuration system. Um, I guess, uh, should we just try to say, okay, if it's, as content in uh, Drupal, then we should treat that as content and try to figure out some different way to manage that con the more configurity uh, taxonomy terms, or is there like an alternative to that? I, I mean, it's it's hard because like once you start to like go, okay, we're going to swap out taxonomies and try and like back them onto config entities, it, you, you're you're going kind of off piste with the way that. The taxonomies are designed to work. So you might break, like, so you might say in, in six months' time, oh, I want to use this uh, nice taxonomy access module, and suddenly that's broken because it makes assumptions about taxonomies that it can no longer make because you've, you've changed how they work. So generally, I would advise trying to, to, to not do that. So either consider, like, if, is it really a taxonomy you want, or is it just like a field with a list of options, and then that's all configurable. Um, but if you really do want taxonomies and you want to deploy it, then it's like look at like modules like default cont content and and use that to like deploy um, to create create taxonomy terms when you're doing like module install or in your in your install profile. So yeah, try and and hopefully in in Drupal 8 sometime we will get to explore um, the, the 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 possibility of adding like content deployment or default content to 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 core because it's it's needed. So. It's a common problem. I feel your pain, yeah. and we haven't answered that question, apart from the fact the only answer we've had is that ta well, taxonomies are content for, for the use case that we've decided to solve in core. I mean, one thing that I've kind of thought of was uh, just having an, my own kind of taxonomy uh, or term config entity. Uh, what do you think about that? Like, like just saying, well, this is close enough to being its own thing, even though it's like taxonomy, so I'm going to call it config, that way it works better with that, but it seems like you're losing a lot at that point. Yeah, well that's exactly what I was trying to say, it's like, you, you then like block yourself from being able to use like taxonomy based modules in the future to solve that new use case that's like your highest priority because your client's going like, I want this, and, okay. and, and you've got a contrary module that would solve it if you'd just not made that decision six months ago. So. Well, thank you. We should wrap up, okay. we're over time. Okay, well thank you all for coming. Thank you.